Welcome to the August 23rd, 2023 jails call. We have Jan, Jamie, and myself, Michael. I suspect others will trickle in. And Jan, you had a question? Yes, uh, this came up when I tried to uh, use slash app use uh, the features FreeBSD grew to support Capsicum over time to execute a dynamically linked binary from the host inside a jail. So the idea is to uh, open all the library directories, the runtime linker and the executable, set up a few environment variables and then basically chain loads uh, via fxec uh, ev into the already open runtime linker and use its direct execution mode to have it in uh, accordance to the environment variables, runtime link the executable from the host after the process has attached to the jail. Inside the jail, using the uh, file descriptors to the uh, library directories to access them from inside the jail, read only of course, uh, to as an alternative to adding jail awareness to every basic network or otherwise set up command, you may want to have a jail manager invoke inside a jail uh, without requiring that the jail is the same version as the host and so on, and has all the commands installed. Um, this may uh, basically expose the jail subsystem to abuses it hasn't been facing before. Uh, because uh, you're not supposed to do that in a lot of ways, but the mechanisms seem to be all uh, implemented. Um, but the jail um, attach system call um, refuses to let me attach to a jail if I have an open directory file descriptor, like I have to have as a workaround, I can have uh, connected Unix socket and then uh, receive the file descriptors after attaching to the jail. But um, the downside of this is that uh, then I have to do all the direct file descriptor passing and it seems like other than for change root there is no CCTL to allow this kind of behavior uh, for jails. Well, for yeah, system. that's uh, really about the only condition that it puts on jail attach. Okay. Is, is it... Go ahead, Jamie. Is uh, yeah, it's the same as uh, ch root, and you might be able to bypass that with a sys control. No, the, the, I found no jail specifics uh, source control, and the one for change root does not take effect on uh, jails, at least through mm, okay. uh, observation. And All right. So it doesn't look like there's a special value to assign to it to also apply to jails. Or if there is, I've just missed it in the kernel code. And, but yeah. And I get it that this is a good default safety behavior. And now I just wanted to know if there's anything else to watch out for, because uh, I found that for uh, basically uh, a startup command similar to uh, yeah, something like sudo, uh, it would make a lot more sense to basically fork off a child process and hold the file descriptors there and retrieve them from the child, have the child exit and so on. After the basically, so that similar to Casper D, uh, or at least how Casper D used to work, you would um, have your helper process started up and then run it as your child process attached to the jail and would keep a Unix socket connection to the unjailed child process to retrieve the file descriptors over the socket. And I just wanted to make sure that I'm allowed to have child processes and, ch and uh, 
the socket descriptor so that I don't restructure it. The advantage yes, you of, are allowed to have those. Because the advantage of uh, basically hiding the file descriptors from the kernel in a child process instead of the more natural way of keeping it in the basically keeping it in the parent process and having the child process is that when it's used in things like startup scripts or for uh, managing jails and so on, it would be nice if the direct descendant of the invoking process uh, becomes the utility command in the jail so that there are no complications for signal delivery because it's your direct child process of you. and it's basically there is no intermediate process in the way in the process hierarchy that can get this to work. You um, may still get problems with signal delivery to the child process because From the child process the is not in your jail anymore. And uh, you can't send signals to a process that's not in your jail, even if it's your child process. Oh, wait. Is the super user from outside? Or just the super user? Um, if you if you uh, change into a jail and your, pri and your child process is not in that jail, then your child process, yeah. Oh, no, the then... child processes would, would exit voluntarily. Oh, okay. So uh, or be instructed then? to do it over the socket. Oh, okay. I see. So it's just a matter of receiving signals. That's fine. Yes, exactly. No, no. The the whole the let's say I am writing a jail manager in something like shell or Python, and I want to basically run this host command in this jail. And if something happens, I want to get the exit code. Or if it takes too long, I may want to send it a sick term or sick int or something. And it would be annoying if I had to proxy. Uh, the signal handlers uh, or the signals to allow the indirect child process to receive the signal because there are some signals you can't proxy like kill <laughs> and it's just uh, the runtime state you end up it is cleaner if the child is only in and very like the child process to hide a few file descriptors in but you're right, I can no longer send a signal. Well, I may be able to do it through a process descriptor. <laughs> and I, I have never checked if you can use a process descriptor to and use PDKill across jail boundaries. I haven't either. Yeah. Welcome, Dan. Hi, Dan. It seemed like the kind of thing we'd want to allow. Yeah. Since they have their Apple. own uh, security built in. Mm -hmm. So, Jan, did you say you have a workaround or not so much? I do have a workaround. Uh, I intended to use the single process, and the workaround is to use two processes. But I have to do refactor the code completely to change the relationship of the two processes. Got it. Uh, which slowed me down. But all of this is also interesting in a more generalized context, uh, which has come up in these talks again and again, and that is the uh, jail demon or long live jail supervisor. Uh, it turns out that all of the things I need to start up a process can be passed to a daemon over a Unix socket. So, or can be serialized because they are things which are really represented by a, a number of things like a user ID. And so it would be possible to basically have a client process, open up the whole setup, including the runtime linker to be used and so on, for a process to be basically started on demand by a daemon. Uh, one of the things this, which could be implemented is basically to have unprivileged access to the jail command or something very similar through a daemon. Uh, but it could also be basically used as a general purpose executor for 
one shot process or maybe if you add a bit of scheduling logic something like cron okay which has a lot less uh, failure cases which can happen at one time okay do you have any syntax examples of this science on the outside um, world yet not yet i okay. have some very rough c code okay well, keep us posted keep at it and were jamie's answers helpful yes excellent anything else okay. on that not yet oh uh, one yes. one point on that so i was looking at the uh at the original question and yes it's true you cannot uh ch root from a jail if you have a directory descriptor open you can also not change root from another change root if you have a directory descriptor open. Yeah. Because that is a jailbreak or even a change root break. So yes. It's, yeah, it's, it's a feature of change root which jail attach piggybacks its directory part upon. Yeah. The real problem is if you invoke something like F change dear on the directory file descriptor. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah or use it for the whole family of something at uh, system calls, open, right. change or whatever, all of them can basically address relative to this file descriptor. And of course, this is a nice way out. So yeah, we don't even, yeah, the, the um, sys control that you can have is only for Change root. And initial change root. Yeah. So it sounds like it should also be for an initial jail attach, though. Hmm? As long as the calling process is not itself in a jail or in uh, a change root. Yeah. But the idea behind all of this insanity is to allow us to invoke co co commands like set fib or in route or whatever. Yeah. Um, without having to go through all of these commands, especially third party commands, which may be installed from ports or new commands, which may not be available. Let's say you're running a 14 host, but you want to run a 13 user land and the command you want to invoke does not exist in 13. Or Potentially, there is an uh, ABI breakage where the feature is not available yet. Or let's say you have a 13.1 jail, which does not have full net uh, link support or something like this. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, keep it coming as you discover things. And answers are obviously available. Dan, it sounds like you have perhaps an open thread? Do you have a question or ideas or answer? Uh, go to the last uh, yep. comment, Nick. Um, the only, the only th this person made a, a, a reply and he's basically saying, rather than do that, just use um, what, net graph instead of being that and that's a valid reply not but really I'm ahead, using let him finish. yeah yeah but i'm using vnet sure he's just saying just use a different tool but yeah for for what i'm doing i understand that what jan said is is the way to work it so jan i'm posting it there in case you feel inclined to reply to him because I certainly can't because I don't know enough about it. So the thing is, uh, the whole problem is basically the violation of the meaning of the scope in IP, especially IPv6. So the I RFCs for IPv6 define what it means to be, have an interface scope. It's the RFC 4200 something, if I remember correctly. And mm -hmm. the bridge main page references the RFC. So all of the member interfaces of a bridge are, have to be effectively the same scope. You can't have a scope spanning multiple interfaces like that mm -hmm. at the kernel level or interface, sorry, API level. 
So the solution is to just make them go away by not having any addresses to be scoped on the <laughs> member interfaces. And none yeah. of the member interfaces is guaranteed to see all the packets. So it the address must go on the uh, bridge interface itself because only that can guarantee that it has access to all the scoped traffic which has it to be uh, processed which is why you can't have a designated member for the IP addresses. And if I had used NetGraph on this jail instead of NetGraph would VNet, work a bit NetGraph. different because it would basically hijack the packet queue going in and out and uh, Interpose itself using the NGE phase, if I remember correctly, or NE phase or something. Uh, there's a NetGraph node type, which if the kernel module for it is loaded, basically hooks all interfaces into NetGraph nodes uh, so that you can basically take out the packets. You would use this to add, define a bridge a net graph and then attach an interface again to it or make it an interface. Yes, that works, but you have all of the complexity of net graph and the performance overhead of net graph and no simplification at all. It's the same problem solved in the sli with slightly different tools in an equivalent way. If okay. you're already uh, familiar with NetGraph and performance of NetGraph is good enough, go with it. There's no reason is... why you should use this approach yeah. unless you have a lot of NetGraph stuff either under your belt um, or inside your system. Okay. Uh, Jan, is yeah. that the right section of the manual page? Oh, uh, this one. Let me open the, oh, there's the document. On screen. Um, we didn't directly link to it. Um, Basically, he's saying RFC four thousand seven. Go ahead, Dan. The statement that a bridge should be unaware of IP addresses is. I'm wrong. not sure if that is true. Well, it's yes just, and no. The problem it, is yeah. that the bridge you see an EF config is several things at the same time. On the one hand, it's the learning bridge, so the software emulation of the hardware switch is we are all familiar with. On the other hand, it's also an IP interface. So it's both a layer two and a layer three thing. Because- It's both a layer two and a layer three. It's not a yeah. true bridge. No, no, it's not the bridge is not just the bridge, but it is also a network uh, interface where you can and, put IP yeah. addresses. And, and so are why, all the member but, interfaces. Okay. Which is so why conceptually that's, that's bridging is a pure layer two thing. And yeah. IP is just the next layer up and it shouldn't matter. The problem is that that's not how the code is written or how the interface has developed historically. So basically his, his last sentence here, I'm, a, I'm assuming it's a he. Now yeah. in the light of this matter, it seems that my belly feeling was correct and that the IF config bridges do indeed create additional issues. Quote, and, and I'm interpreting that as it's not a pure bridge. Um, and it's because not a pure bridge. Let him finish. Exactly. Let him finish. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, and because it's not a pure bridge, you have these other issues that you brought up, which is the scope between interfaces. Um, not just is the bridge not a pure layer two thing, but so are the member ports potentially. Yep. All the member okay. interfaces, be they your physical Ethernet interface or your uh, top interfaces for Beehive bridges or your e pairs for uh, VNet enabled jails, all of them are on the one on the lower level Ethernet and potentially if it's a physical interface a link layer underneath that, and on top of that is the IP layer. 
for all of these interfaces where it's span if it is implemented a layer one and then a layer two and a layer three and if they have offloading features uh, looking into the headers potentially even above layer three where you have things like TSO, LRO, which is really a layer four thing because it inspects and rewrites the TCP headers on top of the IP. And yeah, so all of this is a historically grown mess and NetGraph isn't much better because uh, it loses all of the structure for everything is a packet and there's an arbitrary graph of packet processing nodes you can arrange them into clean setups. You can also create an un unbelievably messy setup. And yeah, there um, is no universal solution. Yes, the really okay. clean no. solution would be to port what OpenBSD has done, uh, where VEB driver, the new bridge driver. Uh, also pasted today was something that uh, FreeBSD Frau, uh, Devin Teske posted yesterday. It, I think it was yesterday. It's a very long um, thread on... Um, you have that link handy? Uh, yes, I posted oh. I pasted it. Oh, I oh, there I was above the last comment. Yes, oh, thank yeah. you. So it she goes on about all the work she's been doing with NetGraph, and it's finally getting stable enough to be ready for everyone to use and take advantage of the things that big ISPs are using it for, just in your own basement at home. Yep. So that that may I mentioned it only because. The net graph discussion reminded me that that's what she'd said yesterday. Yeah, it's timely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that is a yeah and I, I, I'm quoting with that with that attribution in some of the in my reply here. So, historically grown mess is what I was using. <laughs> uh, historically grown mess is the how the layer one, two, three interaction via fconfig uh, and the network stack in BSD has grown. And yeah, the clean solution is what OpenBSD has done in the second attempt to fix this. So their first attempt to fix the mess, which is their bridge driver, which is probably even messier than the FreeBSD one. Maybe that's the reason why they had the motivation to change it. Instead of improve it, they started from scratch. The first attempt was called switch and switch D. They were tried to have a very lean data path, speaking um, open flow to a user space daemon implementing the logic with the idea that you could have a smarter software defined networking controller instead of their simple switch D uh, and use it as an SDN layer two switch which is a neat idea, but uh, the authors of this driver just didn't finish it completely and it was removed. And the new attempt is this virtual ethernet bridging. And where the idea is that it's all simple and in the kernel, but as soon as you add an interface to the, the new bridge driver, uh, the kernel enforces that all addresses are removed. You can't add new ones, and it's a pure layer one and two inter uh, what's remaining. The bridge also isn't a IP interface. It's also only a layer two part of the interface. And if you want to have the host have an address on the bridge, you add the VEFER instance to it. So this is a clean design. Do you yeah. think it's portable? To uh, the design is portable. The, the design, driver but... is probably uh, the complexity of integrating well with the networks that relative to what a bridge is 
means that it's probably better to use the design as an inspiration when bought the code. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But yeah, this is basically they have the proper design to avoid these misconfiguration which are also common because they look so temptingly simple compared to the rewriting your configurations. Hmm. The even better one design, but the one which isn't really feasible is what Solaris did with uh, Crossbow. Uh, yeah, with Crossbow and uh, Fire Engine before that and so on. Okay. They basically uh, defined that there is an API network drivers are supposed to implement. So they changed how the driver, the interface with drivers are implemented against, allowing the next layer up access to the individual buffers uh, or ring buffer queues and mm -hmm. so on, and MAC address handling and so on. And, and packet pacing hardware and stuff like this, so that you can then have basically a zero cost um, virtualization, which is always enabled because it's only instantiated on demand. I see. So basically, you have your what they call an ether stub, which is basically your real NIC interface. And on that, you would put a VNIC, even if you only have a single one. And as soon as you add a second one, you then get it. If there are hardware resources, you use the hardware resources, and at some point you get a software bridge, or if you enable features which aren't available in hardware, basically you can always have the yeah, I see the easy uh, to use configuration which is prepared to accept the later additions, okay. but you only pay the cost as you start using features instead of as your configuration is changed to allow this to happen painlessly. Understood. But Any other wasn't... topics for the week, or shall we call it? A short, short one? Yes. Mm, I figured out how we can have a nice um, VXLAN overlay for a small number of nodes. Um, yeah, just a controllerless VXLAN using only unicast. Uh, do you have syntax to go with that? Yes. Can you paste it or share your screen? I can. It's probably better if I share my screen, but let me add this example configuration here. OK. So I see it. Let's take a look. Okay. I do like your science. And on the next one, it would be something like this. Maybe remove the uh, IP addresses. Okay. Yeah. Or mask them, but yeah, it's not really that. It's just a lab environment. It's all in DNS and F. But yeah, basically just to make sure that it's understood that these are example values and so some magic incantation. Okay. Uh, because otherwise it's so tempting for certain users to just copy and paste examples. Of course. And here <laughs> the idea is that um, the underlying virtualized network does not allow me to uh, use uh, uh, multicast groups to deliver... Uh, broadcast and unknown multicast uh, frames. So instead of doing that, I use VXLAN in point-to-point -point mode where it's always unicast because there's always only a single peer per interface. But then I can't have multiple uh, neighbors. So I collect the VXLANs into point-to-point um, -point VXLAN tunnels as a full mesh between a few nodes. So Yes, a lot of tunnels, but they're cheap. And add them to a bridge. Now the normal problem would be if I used 
no spanning tree, you would expect that it's just a virtual Ethernet loop and you get uh, a broken network with lots of traffic. And if I add spanning tree, you would get very uh, inefficient traffic because one node would basically be elected the root bridge and everyone else would forward traffic over this node, which is also not what you want. Instead, you wanted to discover which of its direct neighbor bridges is the right one without looping. The FreeBSD uh, bridge driver can do this if you uh, mark all of the, the XLAN members as private. The meaning of the private flag on a member interface is that traffic received on a private member interface is never forwarded to any other private member interface. This breaks the loop. Basically, if I have a broadcast from one of the three nodes, it gets, let's say I'm pinging the, uh, some unknown address, an ARP query is sent out, the bridge replicates it to the both tunnels going out, but because the other tunnels and the other bridges receiving them are also private, it's not forwarded and the loop isn't closed. This way, auto discovery using ARP works. Uh, <clears throat> and I can have uh, direct traffic between any bridge. The downside is that all the broadcast and unknown multicast traffic is uh, replicated to every peer, uh, which is a scalability limitation for sure. But for a small setup with a handful of nodes, it's probably quite usable. And if you have the scale, you can still mess around and have a user space control plane update the uh, mark to port mapping on the member bridge. Okay. I, I trust this is another work in progress. Mm, uh, that's a research project, let's say. Let, okay. Like, uh, well, if I'm ever going coming. to do this. Sounds good. Any questions for Jan related to that? Well, Anything else or shall we? Yes, one thing. Yes, please. Shane. I've got uh, a uh, bit of a uh, rejiggered uh, command page, command page oh, to try excellent. to make things look better. Now you mentioned, yeah, just uh, add to the logs. If I just paste something right on this uh, file here, that works? Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, let's try that. Yep. So here's, let's just, see here. Just pop so it if I there. just go right here and just, Yep. Hmm, that didn't seem to do it. Probably because, well. Uh, hit um, it with the original doc, not don't try anything through Zoom unless you just drop it in the chat. Oh, uh, I see. So I have to oh, here it on the doc. That makes here. more sense. Uh, I will paste okay. it in the chat for you for your convenience. Okay. Go for it. Yeah, you can't just paste oh. into his <laughs> screen. <laughs> Well, okay, so if I put it in the chat, then you can put it in the doc? Yeah, sure. Uh, either doc, way. So I yeah. posted the doc or you can paste there, whatever works. Okay, well, let's see. There's the chat. Of course, if I put it in the chat, yeah, let's see how it does. Uh, that's, yes. It will probably lose formatting, but I generally just throw it in back. Yeah, with, uh, that's okay. Probably. With fixed width. So, so yeah, let's take chat. a look. Let's Synopsis, boom. Is. Yep, let's see. So just one sec while that's, I... that's as good as yeah, that's all the formatting we need there. So I oh. yeah, I'm giving it some different section names, moved the uh the most important options to the front, the dash C M R ones, because they were kind of stuck in the middle there. Yep. And at least it makes more sense to me. And yeah. I, you know, it's it doesn't change the information, just puts it in some different but order. It matches the order I use it. Right. Yeah, kind of kind of most to least important there. Uh Dan, as a user, does this resonate with you? Reading. Reading. Are you paying attention? Hey. Uh, Jamie? Yeah. Then 
is there anywhere in the main page, preferably at the beginning, a small explanation when you're in your work busy, what triggers the without configuration file mode? Yeah. Because, yes, I know it is the key value pairs, but. And, and also add, add examples. J j just, just an example so that I want to use configuration files. How do I do that? And an example of I want to use, I don't want to use configuration file. How do I do that? Yeah. Just a short explanation like that because. You want users to be able to quickly get one running easily and not have to guess and get which one to use say, I'm not going to use this. Yeah, and I think all the examples are, uh, well, they aren't all with configuration file. Yeah, examples of running a jail quickly, unfortunately. Uh, you know, jails involve setting up a file tree and things like that. So there is very little to running a jail quickly. Well, for something like just the VNet routing part, you can reuse the host. Uh, oh, that's true. You, you can system, do it without you, a file As soon as you run the RC scripts, that. you have to have a dedicated jail tree. Yeah, yeah, the example section is extensive and, um, you know, I suppose, you know, do I start off with, here's some simple things you can do, and then here's some more complicated things you do? That's uh no. becomes a fairly big no, rewrite. No, I don't think you have to go that far. Just as long as it's very clear to whoever is reading, how do you invoke configuration mode and without configuration mode? Yeah. Sorry, I used the wrong term. Yeah. But just what Jan said about how do you how do you how, what determines this mode and that and that mode that has to be very clear I think and because I which don't, one is required hold on let him finish and because I don't know which one is required I I would have I would have to go and look something up to find out how it works but yeah you, you need that in the in the man page and feel free yeah. to email me Feel free to email me whatever you want to try, and I'll help you with it. The uh, the thing the man page has to say about it right now is the last paragraph in the initial description section before the jail parameters section, where it says a jail may be specified with parameters directly on the command line. Oh, yeah. So after all the options. Oh, yeah. oh that's the difference between with and without. Sorry, you see, yeah. I was thinking the difference between jail.conf and jail.conf.d. I thought that's what we were talking about. Nope. Oh, yeah, jail.conf.d I... is only ever mentioned in the file section of this because it's actually not part of the jail command. It is part of the shell script in rc.d. Okay. Oh, but... I understood the rc script correctly. It's implemented, but it's the testing for the file name and then passing the jail configuration yeah. to each jail. Oh, right, because the RC the D script. Uh, oh, the, the configuration file is I... uh, Unfortunately, the RC D script is yet another layer of backward compatibility. Yeah. Yeah, and the problem some... is that if you pass a dedicated configuration to each jail instead of using what Jamie managed to get in in the form of includes, uh, you end up with no shared global knowledge about even just the definition of the other jails so that you can't have dependencies on them. Uh, so the depend breaks, uh, the ordering is not available. You can't have a single shared definition of variables and so on. So all of the globals have to be repeated and have to be kept in sync, at which point it's uh, 
probably better if you have something like Ansible to use it to assemble the snippets into a yeah. single gel.conf and then use that. Well, I'm using gel.conf.d and using Ansible to populate that. Yeah. But now you can't. But, uh, but, like you said, might, but like you just said, I might as well use Ansible to create gel.conf and then I get dependencies. Yes. Yeah. It'll be good when gel.conf.d brings in dependencies eventually, but I understand why that's difficult to do at the moment. It's in fact, it's um, the the way it is right now, it's difficult to make it ever work because since it got added in as a jail dot, as an rc.d only shell script thing, that means creating the directory for use with uh, multiple jails started outside of rc.d makes it not work inside of rc.d because it expects then to look at those files. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, uh, it was created in a very uncomp incompatible way. And since it looks like it was created after 13 came out, I'm thinking of backing out the whole thing, but time is very short for that. If you, I would agree that it's a, such a niche feature which hasn't been used if there's a time to break it ever, it's now yeah. with the next major release. I'm not saying that yeah. it is a good idea to break, but it will get worse with every release because it's been there for a longer time and more people had time to learn about it. And the problem is that it basically steals the most logical name for the directory to be included from. Yep. Uh, and and people get mind. used to that. Yeah. The only kind of, in a lot of ways, worse workaround I can think of is to have the service grab for include in the canonical jail.conf. And if there's an include directive, then don't do the arrest or something. But this is so, we are going so much deep into fragile auto magic that uh yeah it's disgusting yes but it still might happen that's a good point of course it is <laughs> and we have to jamie, find the least to... bad way out jamie if you want to break it you have my support for what it's worth because i would certainly like to have gl.comp.db have dependencies and is there a way, no, that, that gets ridiculous. I was going to say, is there a way to provide the old method for a certain length of time, say, provide two yeah. rc.d scripts? And Only uh, with for that grepping for the include. Yeah. What? Only with Pardon? the idea of, yeah, of the rc.d script looking for jail files that don't have includes in them and saying, okay, these I can work with. Which is ugly, but yeah. might work. Ugly things often um, do. Yeah, we could just e use etc jails instead of etc jail dot d. Oh, you mean create a new directory? Yes. Yeah, I don't like that. Two different, two different places that have two different directories that you look at. Yeah. No, no. Just write this into your jail dot com to include from etc jails star.conf yeah uh, it's a realistic solution and you could have multiple of those or just what? one you can uh, have it's multiple no longer such a special directory. location it's only the glob expanded from your include directive yeah. this path wouldn't be hard coded anywhere in the scripts and wouldn't have a special meaning yep because I see the advantages to having individual jail files, and I see the advantages to having Etsy jail.conf. I see the advantages to both. Yes. But I would certainly like to be able to have dependencies 
And mm. I'm certainly in favor of not having, uh, of having, um, it's almost going like Etsy syslog.com where you can include files from other directories, but you yeah. still have syslog.com. That's exactly what I'm what striving. Exactly what implemented. Yeah. That's almost what I've, what I've almost implemented. I still it would be have... nice to have that in the Has yeah. this been committed? Oh, that's true. I've implemented it. I just haven't done the um, the part where you can include it based on jail name, but you can still include, yeah, everything in the directory. Yeah, exactly. That's the important part. Yeah. So what you've committed so far has dependencies? Yes. Oh. Yes, it has. Where can I send you chocolate? <laughs> um. You you can make me bid on it at the next BSD can. Okay, um, because that that would make a lot of things a lot easier. Because right now my dependencies are done by order of startup. Um. Oh yes. I, I, list, I list the jails. Yeah. Um. There's a environment. There's a Etsy. Uh, there's nrc.com variable that lists all the jails Jail it's supposed to start. List. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's not ideal because I have to maintain that list. Whereas if it's all declaratory as opposed to explicitly listed, it, it's a lot better for people. It's more true to the rc.d uh, strategy doctrine. Yep. You're doing things. So yeah, if whatever you, whatever I can do to help to get that into fourteen, Jamie, let me know. Okay. Um, there's one more thing uh, regarding the jail command, which I would like to see. That's the handling of um, FS tops. So if I understand uh -huh. the history correctly, what happened is. It grew a feature to mount a few implicitly useful file systems, like the device file system. Then mm -hmm. it grew support for a single mount line. And yeah. then you could have multiples of those. The problem with this is that it's very, very fragile because if the jail falls somewhere and fails somewhere in between, this get, doesn't get properly cleaned up. And if the files left over file systems you want to have, there are still left there, then uh, the jail cannot be restarted until a knowledgeable operator untangles this manually or the whole system is rebooted and hopefully it boots the next time. So, and... The logic for determining if the file system has already been mounted is available in the mount command. So instead of basically processing each line individually, all the lines could be piped into the mount command via standard in, and then the auto mount logic could be used. Okay. So the mount command already has, has support for auto mounting the FS stuff. And it can read the FS tab from def std in, and that is, can be a pipe. It doesn't have to be a file. And then this logic would basically, if there was a problem doing teardown, it would say, well, I'm already in the desired state. There is nothing to be done. There is no conflict. And the base things like the device file system and fdisk fs and other special file systems supported could just be the initial lines to this because they're all at the at least there is no normal file system in between them and the jail route so they could all go to the top of the dynamically generated fs tab and then it could be piped into a single mount invocation instead of invoking each mount command in town Okay, is, is I see. Something, yeah. This would yeah. make is this the... something that Sorry. Is this something that should be fixed for 14? Or uh, is this... The like window is basically plan. closed uh, for anything right now. Okay. The window is closed for the kernel in 14. Yeah. So 
it would be a pretty simple fix, I think, because you would just pipe it into a single instance of the mount command. Maybe once normally once late or something, if you want to support late mount points. Basically do one pass with auto mount and then another one with auto mount late for staggering things if you but uh, they don't see much of a reason to use late mounts in a jail FS tab because the host will already be completely prepared. Yeah, I don't I think maybe that that late feature can just be if someone really wants that, they can run a custom command for it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because what I'm doing at the moment is oftentimes I have basically a here doc string uh, as a variable, and then I use the this at the end of the mount command to uh, have more resilience if something goes wrong. Because otherwise, I often find that all my null fs's are mounted in place, but the jail refuses to start because it can't mount the null fs again, or it can't shut down in the right order because well. It can't remove this file system because there is one mounted beneath it or inside of its mount point, which it doesn't know how to untangle. And if it would just delegate all of this to the mount and unmount command, uh, jail starting and stopping in the face of failed attempts should be a lot more resilient. And all of the logic to detect this and make it impotent is already available in the mount command as is. So the okay. logic wouldn't have to be re-implemented in the jail command. Jan, what so mount that, logic will show the auto mount the logic using mount something like let me let me just grab it from okay. one of my jail.com. Yeah, please do. Uh, go ahead, Dan. You hit something? Uh, no, I was just looking at my own jail doc, at my own fstab files, just wondering, are they actually used? So I have something like this in my jail.conf. Oops. Is there anything sensitive in that? No. Right. And the IP address was not sensitive either. It was just that I wanted to uh, avoid the temptation for someone else to blindly copy and paste something which wouldn't be a syntax error. What's the advantage of this approach? Um. The mount command detects if the uh, mount point is already mounted and then doesn't do anything. So yeah. if the jail failed to stop or failed somewhere doing startup and so on and left the mount points in place, um, yeah, you I can't understand. restart the jail. You have to know what's the problem and yeah. then use you mount manually to clean up. I also and like you can't the use of... even just do it all at once manually, because then the problem is that uh, you, you would have to uh, basically once in time you to mount, you have a, to do a top down approach where you have to mount the topmost directory first, and unmounting has to be done in the reverse. Order. So basically, sort are, versus sort dash r. Are, are you doing this within? A jail configuration file or an FSTAT yes, uh, file? Yes, this is one of this would be in the prepare hook or something. Yeah. In this case, the that's prepare what, hook. That's what yeah. And pretty clever. I, I like the use of paths in there. Yeah. Often for this trickery, I wanted to make sure that. I am not invoking potentially dangerous commands from the host on a jail which has ever been executed. So I created under a temporary path 
do the host commands, which shouldn't be run if the file system content can no longer be trusted, and then move over the directory inside a parent directory. So that afterward, I'm not rerunning the command like package, which would potentially find a conflict and then run an evil um, uninstall hook to resolve a conflict or something or whatever, um, because you can have arbitrary shell commands or Lua scripts inside of a package. Earth. So if a malicious jail would set up this kind of time bomb and the prepare or other hooks running outside of the jail, where to run the package commands for things like package base on the using only the root deal, not change root or uh, jail, because we assume there is nothing there. And then you could basically use the package command as a, yeah, as an arbitrary ac command execution. And because of that, I created first in a temporary path and then move it over once I'm done with it. So that as soon as the jail has ever executed, it's never used like this again. So Jan, does the mount or auto mount logic have a way to simply verify if a given directory, say media, is currently mounted? Yes. What well, sets syntax? It does it automatically. That's the dash a flag. <laughs> that's the okay. auto mount flag. But what if, can I do that a la carte at the command line by just you checking could... without having to parse ridiculously? So pass, uh, mount parses an FS top. Okay, and can I do that without parsing an FS tab? Mount does it for you. Yes, but if oh, do you want you want if to I'm doing removable media, the system is mounted at a, at a certain path. Yes, correct. Without massive parsing, is is there something that handles um, that for me? I've, been, DF, I've needed that for years. <laughs> basically, DF uh, lists all of this yes. on mount dash v, uh, and I think. Both of them, or at least one of them, has uh, libxo support. Correct. Well, then back to parsing. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, you could do basically start this and start its parent using path dot dot and compare the file system ID and start. Oh my. So you, okay. Yeah. Then basically, if it's if this directory is a mount point, then its parent directory will have a different file system ID. You could also uh, use the dash O no cover option to mount, which will not, it doesn't say if it's that particular thing that's mounted, but it will say if if that directory is already mounted on, it will not mount, which in the usual oh. case is what you want. Uh, uh, but it requires that you have permission to mount an and if you only want to check if this mount point, if this directory is a mount point, and you're not privileged to mount, ah, uh, yes, no cover mount will still fall fail with a e perm error because you're not allowed to mount a file system. Ah, uh, not to change the subject there, but d does that cleanup make sense to you, Jamie? Of of perhaps auto cleaning a jail based on FS tab. If um, this, this makes correctly. sense to me for starting a jail that may be not clean as far as SF tab goes. The uh, well, the cleanup problem is that when jails are created or removed, including partial removal of something, something uh, failed on the way is. The remove will stop at whichever command fails in the removal process. It, so it yeah. tries to keep things clean there and keep a set of dependencies. And so sometimes it doesn't make it to the point where it would have unmounted things. Yeah, and I do this, have... This strategy won't change that. What this changes is if you got into that point and the mounts were the only problem, and apparently that's often the case where the mounts are the big problem, then this will be able to move past that. The problem is that the mount state persists while the other things are cleaned up. If the jail is destroyed, the processes are gone and so on. 
but the yeah, that's true. persist, so they are what's left over. Uh, right. This is the first thing which fails. The next thing could be alias addresses or interfaces or other things, but the mount always breaks. And oftentimes, especially for alias chats, it's the only thing that fails. I do have a nasty uh, workaround for the mounting uh, logic, unmounting. And this is something like this. Oh, come on, Trinity. Welcome on, Mike. Yeah. So this slightly insane invocation uh, for a prepare hook um, uses libxo oh to my. get JSON output, pipes it into JQ, passes the JQ script, the jail path, uh, asks for a raw output of just the paths, and then uses the mount dot mounted paths but reverses the array um filters out anything not under the path prefix so basically it has to be either the path or uh, start with the path and a slash um and then it pipes basically this reversed list of all file systems under the jail path into a, a forcible unmount. And Antonik is gone. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite a chunk of shell there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it calls up, but there is no reason why this couldn't be done in CE in 50 or 100 lines or so without calling out to... <laughs> I love how a very long. No, no, short as in, is in C, wow. you don't have to pass it from uh, JSON because you can get the mount points the same way mount yeah. does in a structured form. Basically, call uh, QSort with the right comparator function on it and then. Exec into you basically, uh, or just call the umount um, system calls directly. But yeah, the problem is that you may not want to perform forcible unmounts on anything in the array. This gets really into uh, policy instead of mechanism. And how opinionated would you like your tools? Because if you ever invoke this with uh, a jail with path equal to slash uh, for uh, something like a VNet jail only supposed to be a network stack, uh, good luck, which this will attempt to unmount all file systems it can unmount, failing only at the root file system, but it will take your, your device file system, it will take your other file systems. Uh, yeah. The system will definitely not be uh, usable afterward, but you may not even be able to uh, get a console to uh, reboot. You may have to power cycle the system. Goodness. Uh, if this, so yeah, of course you, this logic could check for this, if, if the gel path is slash then don't do it. But yeah, that's. So that said, uh... Jamie, hopefully feedback received, uh, food for thought, good luck, enjoy. And I, I did hear something about the possibility of backing out something perhaps related to jail.conf.d for 14. What exactly yeah. was that? Um, right now there is support for it in uh, the rc.d script that is kind of at odds with properly using it inside of uh, the jail command itself. Ah, yes. Um, okay, so those present, is does that sound like it should get uh, attention? Perhaps brutal um, attention? <laughs> I, uh, the SC.D logic is out with the jail command line. You I, yeah, ref paraphrase yeah. that. I'm trying to get that right. Uh, I might have that wrong. Yeah, yeah. no, that's with I, I with was, a future command line about. usage at least not yeah with not with not with command not you're actually running it on the command line but with 
including the directory within a com within a com com in sorry getting yeah, the wrong sure. words including the directory within a jail config file instead of through uh, rc.d and when you say include you mean with include the new include functionality I mean with the actual inclu include directive yeah oh so in etsyjail.conf.d slash foo.com i could do another include is that what we're talking about um, no, I'm saying that if you uh, if you say include jail.conf.d slash star inside of jail.conf, but RC is trying to is seeing oh the RC dot jail dot d slash jail name exists. I will just use it, and then it skips the jail.conf because it looks yeah. especially for that file. And it should not be looking for that file, at least if it's being included. But maybe it should if it's not, which is ugly, but might be end up how we're doing it. Okay. I don't know enough. Um, I, I can't. I just dumped the rest of the this example uh, okay. to chat. So, Jan, based on what Jamie just said, what seems to be what's your take on that situation of i guess i would like the existing available. jails that are named so uh, so i would like the jail.conf.t .t or jail.d uh, path to be available for includes but i also think that if i wasn't on this calls it would be surprised by the breakage it would be really pissed off so yes. yeah there so, is yeah, we... no way to make everyone happy either we uh, Get rid of the ugly rack around rc.d, which got it us through a few releases, or and uh, or we keep it around forever. Basically, you could attempt to placate everyone by having it be loud and annoying and warn about this. So basically, if you don't have a the dot include string in there and this directory exists. Uh, make some noise and remove it in 15. Which, yeah, this is the. Well, well, I, I, I think I understand now. What you're saying is that jail.conf will need an include, much like syslog.conf has an include. Jamie has already implemented this. And yes, yeah. but then we're discussing the, so, the problem. But you just the mentioned the problem is if include. someone uses that for the uh, RC dot, if someone uses that for the jail.conf.d directory, then they'll find that it doesn't work as the way they expect because rc.d slash jail also does that. I think the two uh, different things looking at the same files. The presence of this directory will change the behavior of the server script. Okay. Um, it, I think it the, sounds like when. Yeah. I think the the least bad thing we can do is basically if you have an include in your jail.conf and the directory name exists, refuse to start with a loud error message. So if if you have an include and this directory exists, refuse to start because it's probably not what you intended. The behavior which is compatible wouldn't be what you want. And to just use etcjail.d as the documented example instead of jail.conf.d. So that you would just use etc. Somewhere in your jail.conf, you would have something like include... Or whatever the exact syntax is. So there, are, there are some directories which are automatically included anyway. Jail dot mm -hmm. d. Are you saying that there are some jails that are already, yeah like that? No, the the etc jail dot conf dot d directory. Uh, you, yes. It's a bit of a while since I read the script, but uh, yes. let me check what it, is the exact implementation. I I'm now I'm now seeing the difference. I was thinking about jail.conf.d. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, the jail cons dear variable. Uh, if there's so uh, it checks if there's an etc jail dot const dot d jail name. Which man page are you reading? Jconf, no, it's the implementation jconf deal. And uh, then if oh, the, if so, to pass options, it checks, uh, okay, the, the variable it's assigned to is this one. Are, uh, are you the, reading in, the source code in, itself? Yeah, I'm in the jail rc.d script. Okay, and for current or two. Okay. Basically, uh, if me. the configuration, so let's uh, wait a second. Uh, or how did we lock out? Because if uh, jail dot conf wait the j. I don't have a. Wait, uh, no, oh. we didn't. So it also checks, oh no. <laughs> the service meant to, uh, it also uh, checks multiple locations and only in the last case does it check the generic one. Are you looking in your file system or seek it or something? I'm looking at the installed rc.d script on my home server, but I haven't changed it. Okay. I'm in the pass options function. <laughs> yeah, it's... So did I hear that the current jail.conf.d syntax might want to be re-implemented, re backed out and re-implemented, or that would well, upset uh, people. No, it's it's yeah, already it's in 13.2, so even, you know, it's not in uh, anything point zero yet, but, you know, it's already in a release, so we okay. need to tread carefully on it. Yeah, it's really... Hmm. <laughs> Okay, then based on the last hour of conversation, is there a least bad path here and yeah. now? In um, my opinion, the least bad solution is to leave it in place as is and accept that etc slash jailname.conf and etc jail.jailname.conf are blocked by this. Uh, yeah, a safety is, belt the, or documentation. Go ahead. Names. Sorry. Go ahead, Jamie. Sorry. It is only those exact file names that are a problem. So yep. at least that uh, leaves some flexibility. Um. Yeah, that's an other basically thing for the notes section and a warning in the documentation. Yeah. Right. It's um, it's not a code change, which is nice. Yeah, and. The recommendation should just be, in my opinion, to use etc jail dot d uh, for your new files to be included, which still includes jail. It includes dot d, and the dot conf is just not duplicated, which is nicer anyway. Um, of course, this is a J J when you get the next draft of the docs, please send it to me. And I'll review it for you. I, I'd appreciate that because it, I know how much fun it is writing docs. <laughs> well, okay. I just had that one small synopsis change, but yeah, I can talk with you about other things that might fit in that too. Well, if this is solved with some clarification, that might be worth pursuing and then stepping forward, it sounds like, to help. Um, is there a mechanism that needs to prevent a conflict or is that currently handled and we don't have to you know if, if someone gets the naming wrong it'll either fail or warn or otherwise or do we need to add a warning yeah adding a warning uh if you, but uh, the problem is with variables in play you can't really know what will happen okay it's not easy to do this 
unless the gel command itself prevents certain magic paths from working, which is also not good. Yeah, there is no ideal solution, I think. Yeah. And just to re 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 recap, is it simply do not use the same either jail name in a jail.conf and in a directory, in a jail.d directory? Basically, there are two yeah. globs uh, which are blocked to you because they are covered by the old workaround uh, around the missing support for uh, includes. Uh, and the, the shell script does the best a shell script can reasonably accomplish, uh, short of just assembling the single jail.conf and piping it into the jail command or something. So it, what it does instead is it tests if certain files exist and if they exist. So if either fi the file uh, etc uh, jail. Let me just write that out. Sure. If the three of us are in any way confused, the rest of the world will also be confused. And that's not saying we're geniuses, but <laughs> it cannot be too clear. So these two paths for each jail name, uh, which gets started, um, are blocked to you. Uh, when using the new behavior with includes because uh, they will trigger the old behavior where instead of the global jail.conf, which will include this file, you will only get the file you're meant to include as your one and only jail.conf as a parameter passed from the jail RC script to the jail command. And that's guaranteed to never be the safe, sane behavior you wanted to have. But yeah. Is this a correct statement? These no. ads? Okay. They what don't is get correct? started. They get passed. If they exist, the jail command is invoked with them as configuration files. If either of those exist. So um, the first one, yeah. Um, so you can okay, use these. Repeat that. If either of these exist, they are passed into the, the first command. one matching in the order I have yeah. shown them. I think, yeah. Uh, they're passed into the jail command in that order? If, oh, sorry. It's not enough for them to exist if they are readable. Okay. Which is a very minute difference. So if a file yeah. exists but is not readable, then the shell script will not trigger, but because the super user still has access anyway, the jail command could just open it because it's the super user. Which should never be relied upon. Okay. <laughs> to have an unreadable this... configuration file because root can read unreadable files. Uh, okay. Don't do that. Fair enough. So I want to get this communicated correctly. So if these exist and are readable. No, they're... the first one of these, which exists and is readable. Yeah. So it first it, it first checks the, the, sorry, it's in the wrong order. Of course it is. Uh, it first checks etc jail dot jailname.conf. Okay. So this, if this exists, uh, it will be passed as the jail conf to the jail command invocation. If the it the file etc jail.conf.d jailname.conf exists and the other one didn't exist, that one will be passed in. And only if neither of those two existed, the system write default jail.conf, etc jail.conf normally, unless you've overwritten it using the jail.conf and uh, variable in rc.conf. Um, gets passed to the jail command. So, um, and only this last case, the system wide global jail.conf gets used, is what we want. 
if includes are available and used. Because then and there's... Just... Oh, sorry? oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Is this the correct sequence of events, Jan, based on you understand it and Jamie, as you wrote it? <laughs> uh, one thing I just noticed in is a lot of this really is a problem that is often avoided anyway. This is only if you explicitly have a list of jails to start as the R as an RC parameter, the jail oh, no. list. No, no. I'm looking now and that code is not used if you are starting all jails without having them listed. It, it uh, um, completely bypasses that part of the file. Really? Doesn't it just... What happens if you have a jail defined both in its own configuration file and the global one? And um, as long I as use you... the following command, service jail start jail name. Okay, yes. If you, um, <laughs> if you use that command, if you exactly. either have the jail list parameter or you start your jails with service jail start jail name instead of jail dash c jail name then yes it will do that yeah if, so, if you if you uh use if you do not have the jail list command then the rc.d jail will just use the jail command itself with a single config file and if you also are used to just using jail itself yeah as long as you don't use that service jail start jail name yeah exactly. or have so, the jail list which is really not a necessary parameter these days because one, by default it's all jails in the config file so there are two reasons why i'm so worried about this one is that new users will find a mixture of different tutorials and snippets yes. and uh let's say just oral tradition <laughs> Uh, and these will guide them to the most problematic path names because they will have read <laughs> yes. this one pattern they must not use will be the most commonly encountered one in tutorials online. And the second one is that the starting up as, or restarting a specific jail is a very common operation and it would be really nasty to have uh, the restart of a single jail basically have this split brain situation where if you start all jails, you use the global jail.conf, but if you start a specific jail, you could have a totally different jail configuration applied to the restarted one. Yes, that's true. That would be a nightmare to debug if you don't have it really at your as part of your active vocabulary of don't do that uh, incantations. Really. Yeah, I know where I buried my uh, jumping uh, anti-personnel mines. I would never stumble <laughs> home drunk through my front porch. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> it's just uh, an accident waiting to happen. Yeah, true. Is this accurate on screen? And what is it? And what is the least desirable configuration that is often provided through oral tradition? So I foresee the following problematic sequence of events. Let's say in a new free to FreeBSD user but experienced Unix operator yep. um, wants to play with 14, gives it a try and finds online comments, blog posts, Reddit comments, whatever, and sees an example of someone using etcjail.conf.d, puts the jail.conf in there, includes it from the new referenced in the release notes, include a directive, and in the beginning, everything works because he starts all jails using service jail start, the global jail.conf exists, it's used because he didn't uh, set the jail list. Okay, this works. And then he has two or three jails and wants to restart one of them. And suddenly the global configuration variables for things, let's say the domain of the jails or 
the jail route directory and so on is missing and things just break or even reverse uh, he, if you used append to multi-valued variables with plus equals the old values are missing and the new ones may still start up something but not what you intended to start yeah so and yeah so they'll try jail.conf.d or jail. Either way, if you see this as an example path and don't know that this preloaded foot gun is shipped with a release. Yeah. So maybe I would just say if the So for so, the directory, we can emit a loud and noisy warning if you have an include and uh, this directory exists. And is the punchline that jail.conf.d and includes are not compatible? For that one directory. Exactly. It's not that uh, this, basically, the, the problem is that if you're using an explicit jail list or specify the jail list implicitly, on the command line, uh, sorry. Uh, so if you either specify the jail list on the command line or via the jail list and don't specify one on the command line, then the jail service script probes for these files and prefers them over the global jail.conf. Yes. Yeah, this is. This is going to take some uh, thinking about the right way to do it, yeah. And all of these are contrived corner cases until they shred someone's system. So if we were to print a bumper sticker that provided the safety advice or in the manual page, what, how would we explain the incompatibility or potential conflict and collision? Um, that there is no com backward compatible behavior in the presence of an include directory, or oh, there's no reasonable backward compatible behavior in the presence of an include in your global jail.conf and the existence of this directory or a uh, etc jail dot jail name dot conf. So you would even have to check if any file in then you would have to check the glob, and, which makes the jail dot conf script even uh, sorry the jail server script even longer. Mm. Basically, check if this glob matches anything. Yeah. That was longer than a bumper sticker. Uh, yeah, but uh, these are barely, you could say- And a new user the... will not be familiar with backwards compatibility. So what, what do we tell users somewhere? Either use include or uh, this path. You can't oh. have both because there is no reasonable behavior for Okay, so you can't have well, includes well, We or... could do the following, okay, but yep. it would be, <laughs> so in FreeBSD 13 dot something, uh, it's never valid to have the include directive in your jail.conf. So no jail.conf using an include directive can be a valid one we have to support. So what the jail service could do in 14, is to check if there is a include directive in the jail.conf, and in that case, disable this logic. But again, this would probably be the least invasive variant to do it. But the downside of doing it this way is that it's a bit magical. Okay. But realistically speaking, it would probably work for almost everyone, and I don't foresee any danger because there cannot be an old configuration which was valid. So there is no compatibility issue. Interestingly, as it stands, when I added the 
include feature, I put an I put examples of those very files in the examples section. Of course you did. These are the, <laughs> these are the ones you've seen before. Yes. They're the so, ones that look right. I didn't realize, yes, uh, how it would. Yeah, you already problems. stumbled so. about you probably had several browser tabs and editors and shells open where and somewhere on your screen this path pattern was presented to you. In addition yeah. to just being what you've seen before. Yeah. So it what has looks already right. happened. It's no longer just a contrived corner case. Yay. Okay. Did we distill it down to this? In FreeBSD 13, it is not valid to have a dot include in jail.conf. Is it dot include or include without a dot? In it is dot code? include. I did that to uh, make sure it never looks like an actual parameter. Was it ever valid to? Uh, no, there was. This was never. This was always a syntax error. So, yeah. So okay, yeah, that's that, nice. So, it yeah. wouldn't work in thirteen, so that's easy. Problem yeah, exactly. is, yeah, what to say going forward in fourteen? Yeah, but even so, there will never be a jail parameter starting with a dot. Right. So it will even for be, be forward compatible, not just backward compatible. Yes. To just check basically if there is. A line with dot include and no wait with only white spaces uh, followed by dot include. So something like grab Q. Do we just want to check that, or do you also want to check that it's only including the files? Well, that gets no, no, uh, no, no, no. Just yeah. don't mix those two. Dash Q ex. Something like that. Wait, uh, oh no, that's not completely correct. But yeah. You're posting another one? Yeah. It's busy. If there's only white spaces before the include, you have to quote the dot so because otherwise it would match anything in a regex. Okay. And it may be better instead of calling out to, uh, it's probably cleaner instead of calling out to grab to use a raw read in a while loop in shell to do it with built ins because then you can avoid the overhead of forking off a grab. So use read line dash r to get the raw lines into a variable and then use the shell case uh, statement in the in the loop and you can do it all with built-ins. So just post your updated syntax just for reference, for logical yeah, that's reference. A bit too long. Oh, so, but what I mean is you've posted this and you say one should quote the period. Dot. The Single dot has quote, to be double? escape because oh, otherwise it doesn't match okay. anything. Okay. Just something like this, uh, or the equivalent using shell built-ins, which yep. would and then so all. if it finds that, what happens? If it finds that, and a anything matching one of the two globs, so either if the jail dot directory, directory exists, uh, or the um, a file matching the etc jail dot something dot conf exists, it would just bail out and say this configuration is not supported. Or should it, could it do that? Or could it just say, oh, I see that in this case we want to use the yes, that's the jail left. dot conf file. So it not could do bail that. out, but just use the, the file itself. Exactly. It could do that. And yeah. I wouldn't be completely against that. But it's automatical and it would use work for the new deployment. But if you convert an old system, it would be wrong. Because the old jail.conf files you still have would expect to be run on their own. Yes. Oh, that's fine. Because then 
no, it doesn't not. find the include, and so it would run them on their own. If the include includes them, the global one, yeah. Would I, see I do them. assume that if somebody makes the effort to include that file, that the Let's file say includes, one of these files. Let him finish. Let Jamie finish. Go ahead, oh. Jamie. That, I was finished. Okay. Let's say uh, the files you uh, have in etc uh, jail rc.conf.d do things like uh, use the plus equal operator on a global variable. Yes. And if you include them multiple times, while they expect it to be uh, run on their own, what would happen? Oh, what I'm saying is that we wouldn't be including them multiple times if we have that logic to not you to only no. use the uh, base comp file if it sees that it has the includes there. So let's say I, I include the, the old configuration files from an old 13 system being upgraded to 14. Now someone runs this command. Ah, yes, I see. Including the old config files. From the global one, using things like plus equal and so on would create a global configuration which is not reasonable and if you just run the old configuration files on their own that would work but the global configuration would now be broken yeah especially since you know, the old configuration files yeah would each have their own global sections yes and it's quite common if you have multiple ones and instead of using multiple uh, a single multi-line string to have multiple plus equals lines for things like the exec hooks. Yeah. exec.prepare, exec.prestart, start, stop, and so on. And sometimes in these special ones, I've seen examples where people don't do it inside the jail block, but do it outside globally to always add using plus equal uh, the etc uh, rc sh etc rc so that you always run the rc scripts and know basically you would run the rc startup as many times as you have jails included which it's anyone's guess what happens at that point yeah so the, yes it would so yeah in this case basically the old configuration files would poison the new jail.conf and the safest thing would probably just say don't use this so after we've had an example that says these are the files to use now we say these are actually anything but or but the um, so we could add a set or you could uh, add a safety net into the jail command after the globs have been expanded to check if they match the other blo uh, globs and then ignore them, uh, either complain or refuse to uh, even continue and just say invalid configuration and basically make them poison paths or however you would want to call this. But yeah, I don't see them. Um, Universally pleasant solution. Yeah. And we are really getting into the uh, beyond the point where probably someone has to tell us that, yeah, perfect is the enemy of good. And. Well, we don't want landmines, as you described, no, them, especially we don't if upgrading want from land 13 mines, to 14. But there's a point where. At some point, you can't protect. Uh, oh, no, no question. But what you know? Let's just think about about what reasonable warnings exactly. and what um, just safety mechanisms, seat yeah. belts would be useful. The question is, where do you want these implemented? Should they be in the jail command or just in the service script? Given that the so for backward compatibility, the all the logic is in the jail service so the path detection which jail.conf to use but 
if the glob from the global jail.conf or the one passed on the command line for manual use expands to the old snippets, which expect to be jail.conf on their own instead of to be included. Yeah, that's the problematic one. The only way to catch this would be inside the jail command because there wouldn't have to be the server script involved. Yeah. So I, Jamie, I think the idea uh, of someone um, changing the global jail.conf to include these files without actually making the files themselves be the proper files is fairly a corner case that we can just say, I mean, if someone's smart enough to do this and dumb enough to do that altogether, how often is that going to happen? Yeah, that's exactly. That's the tempting, dangerous, define it away uh, thought I had as well. So it sounds like the problem is better understood by all, and perhaps it's something to sleep on. Yeah. Okay. That's all but I yeah, can hope for. A ninety-eight percent solution is good enough. So that's I think. In and the form of documentation or a safety belt or both. In this, my preferred form would be a a safety bell in the jail service, and I think the. Opposite direction, a safety belt feature in the jail command would be too much to ask and would potentially prevent users from doing some clever things. Correct. Uh, so, yeah, I would just say put it in shell. Uh, it's where all the pain is so far, so maybe it should just stay there. You want to take a quick stab at the RC script, having just produced that glorious WireGuard one? No. Uh, <laughs> the WireGuard one is still stuck in review, so yeah, I don't see that happening. Well, don't be discouraged by that. I had my March oh, for the pull release, request I mean. finally get accepted. Go, go ahead. I mean, for the release. Well, that's uh, a different yeah. topic. <laughs> totally different topic. Um, the freebie as well, although that's not a kernel thing, so at least it's... There's no, times no it's, it could go in last second, but I don't. Yeah. Well, well, that's that's a different topic. So anyway, are you willing to look at the proper use of built-ins in the service command to verify the handling yeah. and the presence of includes? Let me, let me have a look at that tomorrow. Awesome. Okay. Lots to so think about. Call. But I'm very glad we touched on those points. Anything else? And again, uh, Jamie Dan is ha happy to assist with the manual page and review what you've, you think is draft syntax, especially if we have, uh, oops, we didn't really mean use these uh, yeah. lines. <laughs> and and I, right. I really enjoyed finding, um, I'm really bad at comprehending, so I'm really good at expanding it. <laughs> you and me <laughs> both, baby. It's like, explain it to like so a- You, you send before. it to me, and if I can follow it, anyone can follow it. It's a deal. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Yep, Thank done. you so much. Yes, Jamie. Nope, just saying bye. <laughs> okay, take care. Thank you. Bye. Until next time.